If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Please check out our YouTube channel page, C Answers TV. That's C A N S W E R S T V. Just type it into the YouTube search box, then click on one of our links for it. Our channel page features 19 playlists on all types of subjects, such as Jehovah's Witnesses with 17 videos. And by the way, these are videos we've produced ourselves. Mormonism, 14 videos. Seventh-day Adventism, 11 videos. Phony TV Preachers and King James Onlyites, 14 videos. Nation of Islam, Black Muslims, this is of the Louis Farrakhan type, 20 videos. God-hating atheists, agnostics, and know-it-alls, 18 videos. Darwin's Metaphysical Evolution Religion, 17 videos. UFOs, Ghosts, Magic, Spiritual Warfare, 16 videos. Islam, such as Sunni Muslims, Shiite Muslims, Alawite, Sufis, 54 videos. Roman Catholicism, Idolatry and the Virgin Mary, 71 videos. Anti-Trinitarians, such as the United Pentecostal Church and Church History, 36 videos. Antichrist cults, the New Age and World Religions, 38 videos. Saved by Works, Baptism, Church of Christ, Campbellism, 69 videos. Hell, Lake of Fire, Unpopular Bible Doctrines, 19 videos. Predestination, Arminianism, and Calvinism, 54 videos. End Times, Supernatural Prophecies and Tough Bible Questions, 20 videos, and others. Our videos are free to the viewing public. If you'd like to be immediately notified of our latest uploaded videos, then please subscribe to our C Answers TV YouTube channel. If you have an existing YouTube account, then simply click on the subscribe button at the top of our channel page next to our ministry name, Christian Answers of Austin, Texas. If you don't have a YouTube account, then it is easy to set one up at no cost. Just search YouTube, then the YouTube opening page will appear, and to the left-hand side will be a blue button saying Create Account. Click on that and follow the instructions. Larry, why do we defend the faith? We defend the faith, Dale, because uh, the Bible tells us to. Uh, a lot of people don't know that because they don't know their Bibles, but uh, if you're a true disciple of Christ, you'll uh, study God's Word, learn what God has to say, and try to live your life according to His Word and not your own opinions, uh, subjective thoughts on what you think should be done. What you, Being a Christian and a disciple of Christ requires you to submit yourself to the will of God. See, this is, the, this is the real linchpin here. Most people don't want to do that. They want to be their own God, or they make up some God that will let them do whatever they feel like they ought to be doing. But the Bible says in Jude 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. 
Now, if you can just do what you feel like doing and, oh, God won't mind and everything, then this verse would be meaningless. Uh, verses where Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to, you, come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Uh, that would be meaningless because if it doesn't really matter and you can believe anything you want, there's no such thing as a false prophet. How can you be a false prophet with any, when anything goes? I can say anything and it'll be right. Uh, the, the absolute uh, pinnacle of relativism. Uh, but the problem is, when we read the Bible, we find that the Word of God, the Bible tells us that this is the doctrine. Paul, over and over again in the Scripture, particularly in First and Second Timothy, says, "Be be 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 uh, on to sound doctrine. Teach with sound doctrine. Uh, sound doctrine, according to the Word of God, is is a is a key to uh, following God's Word." If uh, you, you can believe anything you want, then sound doctrine doesn't mean anything. But Because after all, what is sound doctrine? There is no sound doctrine. I can believe that tree over there is God. What does it matter? You know, it doesn't matter. Uh, but everything matters according to the Word of God, and that's why we're to earnestly contend for the faith. You have to fight for it, grapple with it. That's what the Greek word there in Jude 3 means, To the, the word apologia. It's... Uh, where we get the word apologetics from. It doesn't mean we're apologizing for anything. It means we're defending, we're wrestling, we're grappling with things that come from without. In, in fact, in the very next verse in Jude, right after this uh, key passage I've just read to you about defending the faith, he goes on to talk about false prophets. So you're contending against false prophets, those who come to you teaching you things that are not true, things about God that are not true. Uh, this is why relativism doesn't work. You can't just say anything's true. When you drive down the highway, you can't just believe, oh, I think it, 120 miles an hour is fine. Uh, oh, there's a little old lady crossing the street over there. It doesn't matter if I run her down or not. It doesn't matter. Well, uh, there is such a thing as truth. You'll get in trouble if you run that little old lady down with your uh, Trans Am or whatever it is you've got. Uh, truth is something we, we utilize every day. Now, it's easy in theology for people to say, oh, it doesn't matter, and all paths lead to God, and all this kind of stuff, because it's all kind of transcendental, and you can believe anything. Well, but see, it doesn't work like that according to the Word of God. Jesus, uh, who everybody gives lip service to, I don't care if you're a Hindu, if you're a Muslim, uh, uh, so-called Christian. In fact, most people that claim to be Christians don't know anything about Christianity. They never read their Bibles, and uh, they, they they pick up Bible doctrines like they pick up uh, a dog picks up fleas, they just pick a little here, a little there, and, and they think that's what the Bible says, and that's not what the Bible says generally. It's just uh, legends and myths that they, they believe that the Bible says. I'll never forget, I was at work one time, and uh, uh, this lady w was ready to s swear on a stack of Bibles that uh, the Bible says cleanliness is next to godliness. And, and that's in the Bible. I said, that's not in the Bible. And she says, yes, it is. And I said, get a concordance, look it up. It was not in the Bible. She got that from uh, poor, uh, I think it was uh, poor Richard's almanac from Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin came up with that, but she thought it was in the Bible and she's ready to swear on the Bible, which she didn't know anything about in the first place, but, which I thought was kind of ironic. But uh, the, the key is when you're a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, you have to submit yourself to his will. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, do not the things I say? How can he be your Lord if you don't do what he says? And if you don't know what he says, how can you do what he says? It's, I mean, it makes sense, right? If I'm at work and the boss is supposed to be the boss and he's a supervisor and I'm getting paid to do a job at, at my work, whatever it may be, and he's supposed to be the Lord, you might say, in the, in the sense that he's the boss, and yet I don't read any of his memos, I don't do what he says, I don't bother to study what he says to do. I mean, it won't be long before I'm going to get fired. I'm going to get thrown out on the street. He said, man, I'm paying you a salary. You're not doing what I'm saying. Well, wait a minute now. I thought you meant for me to take two-hour breaks every day, and then I was supposed to sit over here and, and, and read this trashy novel the rest of the time. I thought that's what I was supposed to be doing. Uh, and the boss may not look at it that way. Well, we got a different boss. we got a boss that wrote this Bible, and Jesus said that, if, particularly if you read Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, when he's battling it out with the, 
the devil in the wilderness, every time the devil comes on with a temptation or something, Jesus answers him with the word of God. Jesus validates the word of God. If you're a follower of Christ, then we should look at the Bible the way Jesus looked at the Bible. But people don't do that because they don't know enough about the Bible to even know what Jesus said about the Bible. It's, it, it, it's ridiculous. Uh, so Jesus said that the Bible, the prophets uh, from David to Moses to all, were from God. And yet we get all these scholars today say, well, no, the Bible wasn't written. You know, the, Moses didn't write the first five books of the Bible, and Daniel didn't write Daniel, and Malachi didn't write Malachi. You know, all these things they say, but Jesus said they wrote them. And if you say that Jesus was wrong about the validity of the Bible, then Jesus is a false prophet, and why follow him? But Jesus said you could trust the word of God, and here's the, here's the thing that everybody seems to miss. Jesus said man does not live by bread alone. Now, everybody seems to know that, but they never can figure out the rest of it because they don't know it. And what did Jesus say? He said Jesus, Jesus said man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And this is what this book purports to be. Now, you can't just sit here and give lip service to it and then just do your own thing. This claims to be the Word of God, and it's worth defending, the Scripture says. We're to defend the Word. And when you look at the Bible and you read Book of Acts, you find the, the apostles and prophets debating with the scribes and the Pharisees, the Jews of their day, or whoever. They're out there fighting for the truth. They're wrestling. They're contending for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. And that's why, Dale... We're to defend this faith because if we don't defend it and it's not true, then there's no basis for truth. There's no basis for Jesus. There's no basis for the Word of God or even paying any attention to it. And if, there's, if it's not worth fighting for, it, there's no value in it to begin with. But the Bible says it's true. Jesus says it's true. And if we're disciples of Christ, we're to follow His Word and follow what He says to do, submit our will to His will and do what he says to do, and that's the problem today. People aren't doing that, and that's why they think defending the faith is foolishness. That's because they don't have any basis for their faith, and they, they, they have no uh, source of authority because they just make themselves their own authority, and that's it. Well, that's right, and speaking of authority, um, the Bible is, is uh, our authority, and uh, God has given us clear word and clear evidence, archaeological evidence, some 2,000 fulfilled prophecies. I was thinking the other day, you know, you can look into every religion on this planet, and they all crumble under inspection. I mean, whether it's you made up a God of your imagination, whether you're just following it for some odd you know, reason just because you grew up in it. If you look into this religion, whatever it is, if it's Islam or Catholicism or Jehovah Witness or Mormonism or Hinduism, uh, they're actually very illogical. They're filled with flaws and errors, and they don't make any sense at all under inspection. But when you study Christianity and what it's really saying, and you look at the manuscript evidence, and you look at the scientific evidence, and you, you look at all the evidence, it only gets stronger and stronger. It's very, very clear uh, between the, the uh, false religions and the true, uh, true religion of Christianity. And... Um, and that's why the, the Satan, who is called the ruler of this world, the kind of the under ruler over this world, he uh, he attacks scripture and the authority. Uh, and all these uh, attacks from humanism and even Catholicism, especially Catholicism, Latin American countries, mm -hmm. they they keep people away from the Bible. They used to have all the sermons in mass, uh, masses in Latin. They had um, they they usurp the authority and they say the authority is the church. It's the only thing that can tell you what's really true, you know. But um, it, the attack has always been by every false religion on the Bible, and uh, they want to distort the gospel. The gospel is the good news that Christ left us with that how a man can be saved. And Dave, for our audience out there, what's the true gospel and and uh, that's always under attack, and and why is it always under attack? Okay. Well, in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, Paul makes an astounding statement. He says, for as in Adam all died, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. What Paul's saying is that when Adam sinned, every human being that's been born on this earth that was in Adam, because all were in Adam, they all were condemned, they all died, they all died spiritually, and where they were born, they begin to manifest physical death. You begin to die when you're born, showing that you're spiritually dead. 
they were spiritually dead to God. And, and because they're spiritually dead when they're born, they, they're transgressors. They do all kinds of transgressions. Even in their so-called goodness, it's sin because they're doing it for their own purpose, not for the real true glory, glory of God or their false gods. And so God, uh, in his rich in his mercy, could have, he, he could have in his justice condemned everybody, everybody to hell and, and saved no one. And all that are born are condemned to hell right when they're born. But God was rich in his mercy that from the very beginning he promised a Savior, a Messiah that would come to save his people. He chose a group out of, out of the whole world, a small group, and brought them out of Egypt of great signs and wonders and drove other nations out and put them into a land, gave them his, his law and his testimony and the oracles of God and the, the ceremonies in the temple. And he promised this Messiah that would come through the, these people at, at, at the right time. And as Paul said in Galatians, at that time, Jesus Christ came, the Son of the God, the, the very God, God the Son, he came and took on a human flesh. He did not uh, stop being God. He became the God-man, and he lived under the law, under the most strictest law that 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 anybody could ever live under that he fulfilled both internally and externally in front of all the hostile witnesses saw his life and, 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 and looked at his life and he lived a perfect and holy life for his people and he raised the dead he healed the sick he did miracles in front of, front of, in front of them but they still didn't believe that he was the true Messiah they wanted a Messiah that would relieve them of the oppression of the Romans or they wanted a Messiah that was uh, the Messiah of their own imagination. But he came to die on the cross for sinners, but he came to save the lost. He came to save the ones that were condemned in Adam, the ones that God chose to save. He came to save them. He had a purpose. And he came and he died on the cross. And he took God's wrath. The Father poured his wrath. That I can't even begin to tell you the wrath that, that Jesus Christ took on the cross for sinners. And he paid an ultimate price that none of us could pay. He was the holy Lamb of God. He had had no sin, but he became a sin offering for us. And he fulfilled all, all of the righteousness that God demanded of, of, of his people that we never could do, that Jesus lived a perfect life, but yet he died in our place, a sinner's death. He paid it in full. He paid for all the sins. He took God's wrath and, and, and punished for that he was going to punish that his people. And he was buried and, be, and he rose again physically showing that he was sinless and he was the Lord and Christ. And his disciples went out and preached this Jesus whom was crucified and now is risen and said, repent and believe on him. Trust in him that he has paid your, 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 your sin price, that he has redeemed you. Trust only in him. By faith, you receive that. You're not saved by your faith. You're saved by the finished work of Christ. How you receive that is by faith. That's the instrument that you, you bring it to yourself. And you, no one will believe unless God is dealing with you, unless God opens your heart to believe. But God has commanded all men everywhere to repent because there's going to come a day when God will judge all men through this, this man, Jesus Christ, the God-man. And if you have not placed your faith in, in him and trusted in him and his finished work, you will be condemned to hell. Because you cannot live the perfect life. No matter how moral you think you are, you have sinned. And you're dying, you're, you're physical death, you're dead spiritually, and you will be condemned to hell unless you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ for your salvation. And that's what we're here for. And, and that is a gift of God. And it's no longer, you cannot earn it by works. You can add your works to that by faith or grace. It's because Jesus, by his obedience, by his obedience and his perfect life and his atonement has earned salvation for his people and he gives it as a gift to his people. In the promise of the Holy Spirit he will give you so you can live for him and you can walk with him and believe him, believe his word and trust his commandments. You won't be perfect. You won't understand everything in the Word of God, but you will understand it. You're saved only by the work of Jesus Christ. You'll understand he's, He is the Christ. He is the God-man. You'll understand the basic essentials of Christianity. The Holy Spirit will show you that. Thank you, David. 
Um, that's what our show is about. We want you to look at the evidence, hear evidence you haven't heard, answer your questions. We'd, we'd hope that you'd get to the point where you'd ask God to give the ability to turn your life over to Jesus Christ. And that ability, it can only come by uh, from God. And uh, in fact, if you're watching the show now, there's a, there's a good chance that, um, that God is uh, working on you. Uh, you know, if you can stand watching this show or if you're curious about this sort of thing, uh, there's a good chance God's working on you because most people aren't uh, interested in truth anymore and, and really are, are never really interested in truth. Um, even though they think they're truth seekers, they're really seeking what they kind of want to do. Yeah. Are you on, Gerald? Hello. 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 Can you hear yes, us? Uh, I had a question for you. Sure. Um, you had read 1 Corinthians 15 earlier, and I wanted to attach something to that that someone presented to me. Um, in 1 Timothy 4, 10, and 11, it says there, and I've been told the Greek specifically says that um, it mentions that Jesus is the Savior of all people, especially those <laughs> that believe. And... Um, I was told that the word especially in the Greek means that and only that, indicating that it's not a contradistinction in the sense of salvation, but it's simply that those who believe have an advantage, of course, but in, but in the end, when the ages are finished, that all humankind will have salvation. Okay, could, so could that, you comment upon that? Yeah, that would be called universalism, and the Bible nowhere teaches that. Uh, you have, you know, from the Old Testament where, you know, God destroyed the uh, entire world except for Noah and his family, uh, you know, to, uh, to where Jesus said that um, broad is the road to destruction and uh, narrow is the way that leads to life and few there are that find it. I mean, it's, it's uh, replete with, you know, uh, verses that, that show that uh, very few uh, relatively are going to uh, end up in heaven. Uh, but, uh, David, you want to answer that verse? Well, and the first thing we'd look and see if, if Paul's contradicted himself in preaching the universal salvation, we'd read in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians where he, he says that in uh, chapter 1, verse 7, and he says, And to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well as the Lord, uh, as well, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven, with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So Paul doesn't believe what he wrote there means that everybody will be saved. He says there will be eternal destruction. And that eternal destruction doesn't mean they're going to be totally annihilated. That means that their purpose of what they would be to glorify God, uh, they're going to be to totally, eternally damned and, and be in, in total separation from God and in, in torment for eternity. Uh, what Paul uh, is uh, talking about here, and, and there's a, a way to look at it, is that in, in, in some sense, Christ is the Savior of all men in that he, he uh, uh, is the only Savior that can save anybody. But in his provincial uh, uh, lordship, he watches over men, he, 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 uh, he rules over men, he's good to the, the, the ones who, who uh, do wrong, they, the rain comes down on them, the, the, the wicked have happy uh, marriages, they're, they're all the things that come through the Messiah, has, has uh, all good things come to, to Jesus Christ. But he's especially of the believers who have trusted in him for salvation and know of him in a personal, uh, intimate way more than anybody in, else in the world. And so he is not the savior of, of every man because every man is not saved. So obviously, Paul says that in Thessalonians. Jesus says it. All the apostles, the whole uh, Bible testifies that there is a contradistinction. And uh, whatever they're talking about in the Greek, it has nothing to do with, with uh, their eternal uh, uh, salvation that he's, he's saying here. And Larry may have a, a word he wants could to I, Could I make another to... point that they make? Okay. Another point they make is that that word eternal in the Greek does not mean eternal in the sense that we think it means. It simply means age abiding. No. Or, or a, peri a definite period of time indicating that judgment will come to an end. And therefore, 1 Corinthians 15 says 
that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And they also say the word death does not mean the process of dying, but there is absolutely no more death. No, it's the last enemy that is death is that the, the, the death of the human body, because he's talking about there the resurrection. There's no more death for the, for the uh, immortal that, that is raised. It's the resurrection chapter, because he's talking about the, in the twinkle of an eye, the dead in Christ will rise first. And, and then it says it's fulfilled. Death will be swallowed up in victory. He's talking about the resurrection of the body. There will be no more death. And plus that uh, uh, there's no more spiritual death because there will be glorified bodies. Also, to, to say that they're totally wrong in that because in, in Matthew, if that's the case, then our eternal life comes to an end. Because he talks about in Matthew 25, 46, it says, And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And that's the same word. So according to you, if that word eternal means what they say it does and it doesn't, means our eternal life comes to an end. Well, do you, no, do you what, believe that? Well, no, what they say, they say the emphasis is life upon that life in the context of that time of what it's talking about. No, eternal life means they're not only longevity, but quality of life. But, uh, yeah, they make that yeah, point. They and make Jesus point said, means quality. but whoever believes in me will not die, and we do die. Was he lying? Oh, no. They would, they would say the wicked die, but there will be no. a resurrection of judgment that will lead to purification, the hellfire's purification process. No, it judgment. says they're in torment. Their smoke of their torment comes up day and night. I don't know. This Greek thing is just, uh, is just totally wrong. We can get the, the Greek lexicons out here, but well, they are saying... Say one more point, and I'll shut up. Well, they, they're saying it's wrong. What I'm saying is the contradistinction here in Matthew 25, 46 is the either eternal's eternal punishment... For forever, our eternal life is not what Jesus promised it would be. Okay, let me make one more point. That word you just used in Matthew 25, eternal punishment, mm -hmm. that Greek word, I don't remember the name of it, but it's only used two times in the Bible, and it means pruning. It means to prune, no, words, to make better, that, to, ju it, to the, judge, to make better, it, instead of destroy. No, it, it means that they're being punished. It does not mean the, the, the being pruned to do any better. It means they're being punished. And I read you what... Paul says eternal destruction and says, Jesus says, do not fear the one who can kill the body, but fear the one who can kill and then destroy the body and soul in hell. And that word destroy, if you go look into it, doesn't mean annihilation, means destroy the function of, means they're going to be tormented forever. It's very clear that the eternal punishment is, 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 uh, Jesus talked about that more than he did about heaven. Well, it's let me very clear. Let me jump in with some Greek stuff here. The fire which torments the wicked in Gehenna is the eternal fire, 18.8. Uh, the Greek emphasizes the word eternal by placing a definite article before it. In the first usage of aeonis, which is the Greek word, in the New Testament, A.T. Robertson comments. Now, A.T. Robertson was one of the foremost New Testament Greek scholars in the 20th century. Anyway, he's, he quotes it here uh, from his, uh, one of his Greek books. The word ionis means ageless, without beginning or end, as of God, Romans 16, 26, without beginning as in Romans 16, 25, without end in, in here and often. Uh, the effort to make it mean aeonian, fire which will make it aeonian life also. If the punishment is limited, ipso facto, the life is shortened. Uh, we, we go back to the original question which is in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. It says, Therefore we labor, uh, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God uh, who is the Savior of all men, especially those that believe. And then I happen to have a, a quote here from A.T. Robertson from his word pictures in the New Testament, page 580. It says, God gives life to all men. He quotes 1, Corinthians, I mean, 1 Timothy 6, 13, Acts 17, 28, and creatures. Uh, and he gives distinction he, you know, on, in A.T. Robertson's book about the distinction of kinds of salvation, he mentions the passages such as where on Palm Sunday, as you, as you recall, uh, the scribes and Pharisees were mad when Jesus came in on Palm Sunday and everybody's saying, Hosanna, hail to the king. And they were mad and they're saying, all men everywhere have gone after this man. Now, did the scribes and the Pharisees mean that every last man, woman, and child, infant from everywhere on the face of the planet were going after Jesus on Palm Sunday? They said all men everywhere. No. When you check the, the, re, the, the reference to what they meant by all, 
They weren't talking about every last man, woman, and child. And as David was trying to point out earlier, and I've got many cross runs here, Matthew 13, 47, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Uh, we get into 2 Timothy 3.15, Titus 1.9, and, and many other passages here. I, I, it's too much to get into in, in detail on well, this Let show. me ask you this. I'm please. just saying all doesn't mean every last person. Okay? Well, that, that, well, but see, let me ask you this. Are you saying then, I know the, the, that they maintain that the soul can be destroyed. They don't, they don't right, deny right. that. Right, right. We're talking about annihilationism. Well, no, no, no. No, they say the soul can be destroyed. They, they say well, that's the what annihilationism is. But they say the spirit is what is eternal. And they would ask you this well, you question. Well, you got to remember, spirit and soul are synonymous in the scripture. If 1 Corinthians 15 says death, there will be death. Now, they would ask you if there's eternal punishment, how is it that God is, is keeping people alive and giving them eternal life and also burning them throughout eternity? If that's true, you've got to accept the Mormon doctrine that the spirit is eternal from all eternity. Why is that? Because. Because if the spirit's not eternal, past and present, well, wait, then wait, you'd be wait. saying that it, God's it, given it, them it, life. No, God that's not. Corinthians says there's death while they're burning. No, that's not true. Is that when the uh, the spirit is created, it cannot be destroyed? That's the, that's the answer to that. That see, they referenced their question in a box, which is a was is, is a red herring. It's a false uh, nomer. It's canard. Well, let, let's they go. They put to, you in a box, let, having to answer that. That, that they frame the question wrong. Let, they start out with a wrong premise. Let me that go to the. Let me go to the word. Yeah, of, it's the wrong premise. Okay, let me go to the word of God on this. Uh, Revelation, uh, twenty. Uh, no, nah, let's see. What is it? Twenty. Uh, uh, verse ten. Uh, is it verse ten? The devil and those that deceived him was cast to lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, same thing with eternal, forever, eternal. Uh, they mean what they say. You look over here in uh, then twenty-one, chapter twenty-one of Revelation, in uh, verse uh, eight. It, it talks about the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual, immoral, sorcerers, idolater, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The second death is, is also forever and ever. And, uh, is uh -huh. it, the second death is thrown in the lake of fire and it's destroyed. No, it says here that it will burn forever and ever. Didn't you hear the verse I just read? Wait, wait hold on, hold on. You, you're not looking at Jude 7. In Jude 7 it says Sodom and Gomorrah, those who were there burn forever and ever. And it's not no, I mean, the verse, the verse that I... they wouldn't be around to... Uh, the verse, the verse yeah. that I just said yeah. about the sea gave up the dead, and death and Hades delivered. All right, back in verse 20 again, death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death you were just talking about, right? Right. Okay, and it just said they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. But that simply means from one age to another. Well, no, Greek. no. See, yeah. you can't, you can't Greek, just try to twist the, the doctrine to fit what you want to believe. We have a life with yeah. the first definition of strong the word eternal in yeah. Greek. See, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And, and because there's not an understanding of, of God's uh, eternal judgment, uh, God is an eternal God with eternal judgment and eternal life and eternal punishment. And you have uh, on the atonement of Jesus Christ, the God man, you had to first of all have to have a human because we're sinners and we're human. We're the ones who sin, and the atonement has to be from a human. So Jesus was the God man. Does this group, by the way, believe that Jesus was God? I'm not sure about that. I think they do. They say yeah. he's the Son of God. Better check no. into that. Check yeah, you into that. You've got to be careful about these Greek references these kind of people come up with because so, uh, I've mentioned A.T. Robertson. Well, give me, I'll give you a, a brief example. I have the paperwork in my files here, but when I was dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses, they deny that Jesus is the eternal God, okay? And then they, in their book, particularly their Kingdom Interlinear Translation of the, the New Testament, they give all these Greek scholars who are supposed to be agreeing with them when they translate John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was a God. And then they give these Greek references down below saying, well, a Greek says because there's no definite article before the, the word theos, which is God, then it has to be a God and it can't be God. But all the other translations say in the beginning was the Word, words with God, and the Word was God. Well, anyway, I went to the, the, the seminary over here, the Austin Theological Presbyterian Seminary, and I went in their library, spent all day in there, and I looked up all these Greek references that Jehovah's Witnesses have put in their Bible uh, where they quote, uh, eight, you know, um, uh, Manta, uh, uh, Manti, and, uh, and A.T. Robertson, and all these Greek scholars. I looked them all up, page numbers and everything, and lo and behold, 
You know what those Jehovah's Witnesses did in their kingdom interlinear and their other uh, works trying to deny that Jesus is God in the Greek? They misquoted all these Greek scholars. In other words, I would find the passage that they were talking about and the Greek scholar would, just to make a long story short, would, would have a, a, a statement saying exactly what the, the, the Jesus is God, but what the Jehovah's Witnesses was do is leave out the part of the sentence where he's stating that and put an ellipsis there. And then use the part of the sentence that made it look like he's saying the exact opposite. <laughs> and so they would quote that in their, in their kingdom interlinear uh, yeah. at the back of their well, book. It's, and, it's, and so what I'm saying is yeah. when, when people quote Greek guys and say the Greek says this, don't trust it. You got to go do yeah. your own research. Deceivers that's deceive. What I've done. Yeah, deceivers deceive, right. and that's what uh, Satan is. You know, his followers. Uh, Satan is called the father of lies, and his deceivers deceive. And but, so, what, what, but what do you do with Jude seven? Well, the context is clear: forever can't mean forever because Sodom and Gomorrah is not still burning. Well, we can look Jonah, at that. So, and we also, do have. We have to. Jonah, we have. It says Jonah is the of the well forever, and he's out three days later. Well, we'll have to. It let's, says here, where even as Sodom and Gomorrah yeah. and the cities uh, about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after yeah. strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Yeah. Well, they're they're, they're, the they're suffering forever, just like in forever. Luke, Luke yeah. 16, the, the rich man is suffering, yeah. waiting for judgment day, and he's still there, and he knows what's going on. In fact, we we did a. A, a four actually, hour series actually, on that hell. proves our point. Exactly. So See, that, that, that actually that, proves our it point. It shows that Sodom and Gomorrah are, no are still burning. Suffering. How can it be eternal? He's, he's talking about he said, using them as a relationship. The people that were in Sodom and Gomorrah, all the people reading there knew that these people in there, not the cities, but the people are there now in eternal punishment forever and ever. Or Jesus said, it doesn't say that. the worm doesn't die, yes it does. It says, as example, undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. You can't punish rocks and sticks. It says, Why is that punishment? It says that they are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And then he says, yet in the same way, these men also dreaming. He's using the analogy of relationship. Yeah. It's very the clear. men that related to Sodom and Gomorrah in eternal punishment and these men, relationship with them pre preaching false doctrines. So, so you're saying they're burning in hell now? Eternal yes, fire, sure. yes, of course. Death? What is death? Sure. I mean, Jesus says you have eternal life if you accept See, him. See, it's what, all coming what, down what to is, your what interpretation. What is death if they're living now? Well, well you, you got, got the second death. death. We already yeah. have the first death. That's death. Then you have the second death. Yeah. We just talked about now the second Now listen to this. Day. Listen yeah. to this real quick in Ezekiel. You, this just came to mind while we were talking here. Ezekiel chapter 28, uh, verse 17. It says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings. They will behold thee. Thou hast defied thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy uh, traffic, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished by thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. And then it goes on to say about how uh, these people will say, is this the guy that did all these things? Is he the one? And, and these are the ones that had gone before him, just like in uh, uh, where Jesus said, Woe to thee, Chorazan, uh, in, in these other cities. They will rise up in judgment against thee. Uh, what is that in uh, one of the Gospels where Jesus mm -hmm. is, is uh, Woe to thee, Chorazan, and Bethsaida. Yeah. They will uh, stand up. They will stand day. up against thee on that day. In other words, you have references here in the Old Testament where here God's destroying someone, but then there's other people who've been destroyed before them who yeah. are talking hold about, on. is this the one? That hold, did on, this? hold on, You've got to get the whole picture. It's like Paul Harvey says, you've got to look at the rest of the story. Yeah, but if they didn't example. exist anymore, yeah, that's what they wouldn't be to rising you. up in judgment against them. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. And, Mal and Malachi talks about the wicked being destroyed and there's no root or branch left and the righteous walk on their ashes. Yeah. But in Psalms 22, Psalms 22, I think verse 24, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. It says, all who go down to the ashes shall be risen and given life. It says that specifically in Psalms 22. Mm -hmm. and the then second thirdly, resurrection. My, my last point. You my remember the point. damned are raised the and damned resurrected. Raised the resurrection also. for judgment day. We, we agree You know that, that right? Yeah. yeah well, let I mean, me, everyone knows. Yeah, wait, even the, wait, even wait, the pagans the know that. Are hey, let me add forever. This. The judgment the day. Yeah. that ring a bell? Zephaniah 3. Hold on. Zephaniah 3. It's only got three chapters. Just remember, the damned will live forever. 
They're okay. not destroyed. They're going to be here for all eternity. If you read Zephaniah 3, and I've checked this thoroughly, all major theologians will tell you Zephaniah 3 is the last great day again. judgment of the Lord. Read Zephaniah 3 carefully. can't remember the exact text. I can see verse 8 here. It says, Therefore wait uh, ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up in the prey, or to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, going. for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. And then you have cross-references mm -hmm. sure. in the no, no, you Second going, Peter chapter 3, it. verse 7. Also Philippians chapter read 3, chapter, verse 19. Says, God's going to purify the whole world, purify the language. Is, that is the ones that read come. Read the whole chapter of Zephaniah 3. The ones when it, it says, says... God's going to purify the entire world. Right, and you get that in Second Peter chapter 3. He tells yeah. you what he's going to do. Yeah. It's, it's only for the righteous. He's going to purify the world, but the only righteous are going to live there in immortal, eternal bodies. But here's what Jesus says. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom, his kingdom, all the stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, if you're destroyed, how can you weep and, and gnash, gnash your teeth? teeth? I mean, yeah. if you're destroyed, you can't be weeping and gnashing your teeth. And you can, and you can, and you can, no. No, you can compare a Second Peter with uh, three. 310 with uh, Zephaniah. You, got your, you might call a Roman Catholic and you have this purgatory thing. There's, there's no <laughs> hope. See, Jesus Christ took the eternal punishment. You don't understand of the, of the atonement. That's what I was trying to then, get to. Then, then if, if this uh, uh, fire can purify people, then God crucified Jesus and punished him and we're fools to believe in that. We've got to run on, but thanks a lot Wait, for your questions, all right? Comment. Well, we got other callers, Zephaniah all right? Zephaniah 3, 8 and 9 says, The whole world will be consumed, and then I'll purify the lips of the people. All of them may call on the name of the Lord. I just, yeah, I just told you there that he's going to okay, have thanks. his people of his thanks kingdom, and all Thank other you. people will be cast in the furnace of fire, yeah. and there's going to be a new heaven and, and a new and earth. 2 Peter 3 clarifies yeah. it all. Then I yeah. just say, check it, and look yeah. up 2 Peter 3, 10, and it says that, that uh, God is going to destroy the earth with fire and melt all the elements. So what uh, what ought a people ought you to you know what kind of people ought you to be? And it's it going to be a new heaven and a new yeah, earth. Yeah, and he says, but by the word of his present heavens, earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. I guarantee you, or I, I'm pretty sure that this group does not believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. Oh, yeah. And so this is a good, easy test for cults. Uh, ask if they believe that, that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. Most of them do not. Then the other test is, do you add works for salvation? Is there some kind of work you must do, some kind of mystical experience, some kind of sacrament, some kind of uh, ritual, some kind of wor good works plus the atonement of Christ for salvation? Those are two good, easy tests to see if these guys are false religions, cults, and of the devil. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the atonement, Jesus Christ paid specifically for a person's sin. A person, God knowing, who would turn and trust Him, one He has elected, one He has drawn, one that has repented and turned His life to Jesus Christ, then His sins were every one, every single sin that person ever would have committed, thought, word, and deed, were put on Christ and punished at the atonement of Christ. The wrath of God, the eternal wrath of God was put on Christ, the God-man. And the, the second person of the Trinity, the Father, put the wrath of God and He took it as a man, as the God-man, Jesus Christ. Specific sins for each person that would turn to Him. The sins have been paid for. There's no more burning. There's no more suffering. There's no mention of purgatory. You're either justified by that or you're lost. You're either saved or you're not. You're eternal spirit creatures. You're going to live somewhere forever. But you're, you're, the Bible clearly says it's going to be heaven or hell. And both of those uh, places are eternal. Clearly in Scripture, just read what it says. With that, we got a, we have Pete. Hey, Pete, how you doing? Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Um, I've, I just started watching your show. I've seen you a couple of times on TV, and it, it kind of puzzles me. And I'm not being disrespectful to, to the three of you, but it just seems like um, it's either your way or it's nobody else's way. How do we know that what you read and what I read you know, which one is correct? Okay. Are we talking about the Bible or Christianity in general or all religions? Actually, the, 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 actually it's kind of like an all-encompassing uh, question like, 
Uh, I may read one Bible and it has one version. You may read another one and it has another version. Okay, well, let's, let's start with, uh, with all religions. Basically, they all can't be true, and we know things are either true or false. All things can't be true, and everything can be false, but it all can't be true. That's just a law of non-contradiction. That's, you know, that's logic. And the Bible claims to be the Word of God. All the authors and, and uh, you know, 66 books and all through uh, the thousands of years on three different continents, it claims to be the Word of God, and it's verified by a lot of evidence. First of all, we want to give people the evidence, the archaeological evidence, the prophetic evidence. And then it has to do with the, you're bringing up the point, well, how can we trust this translation? Maybe King James versus American Standard versus New International. I don't care which version you're, you're reading. They all basically say the same thing. New King James, King James, New International, American Standard. They're, they're English translations of the Greek. And we have Greek manuscripts dating back to the first century, 24,000 of them or something like that. Uh, scholars have looked at them. There's no mistranslation. Uh, so it comes down to, can you understand English? And so you read it in context, and you know, did Jesus mean that I'm the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to the Father except by me? Or did he mean you can do whatever you think and believe anything you want and everybody makes it okay? I mean, you know, it has to do with just simple reading the verse. What does it say in context? But you can get, that, you can get concordances, you can get <laughs> lexicons, you can get, you know, different, uh, different helps. Sure, study Bibles are great. But, um, I mean, there's really no problem in the reading of plain English translations. Uh, they're not saying totally different things. They might use a word, you know, one might say uh, Christ, one might say the Messiah, or one might King say James thee, say one might carriage. say you. Carriage. Well, King, let's say carriage in the old English, but yeah. then we know that means There's no change. Now. What I was saying, if you read it, <laughs> there's no change of the meaning, you know. The problem isn't, isn't what it says. It's like... Uh, it's not the problem with what it says. It's it's a problem is we don't like what it says. Well, what the bigger <laughs> That's problem the big is thing. people don't know what it says. Yeah, well, that, well they and don't so want to know because we want to do our own thing. We want to, you know, a lot of people I talk to that don't have any clue what the Bible says. They they want to they, they pick and choose some kind of verses out of the Bible that kind of back up they their don't read in their philosophy or mm. something they've been taught. You know, like oh well, Jesus basically just taught good teaching and be good. Well, no. Jesus said many things like he said that uh, the Pharisees, the most religious people there, were a brood of vipers and their father was the devil. I mean, he, he came down hard on spiritual people, on religious people, on people that were all doing good works and stuff. Uh, you know, God's wrath is in the Bible because of his justice, his holiness. Uh, God's love is shown on the cross. Jesus, you know, he, he walked among us and he died for sinners and rose from the dead, and, and God offers salvation. Uh, you know, I mean, it's all there. It's all plainly there. Do you have a specific uh, confusion you want to talk well, about? Well, I mean, it, it just seems, and uh, I'm just speaking just, just straight to you, it just seems rather pompous that you would think, okay, if you can read English, how do you know what was translated from the from the old old writings to English? Well, we have, we have, correct translation? go ahead, Dave. I, I, already <laughs> answered, I already answered that, but, but I mean, let's I, answer. I understand that, but see, okay. can what I, I'm going to say is, okay, can, can I, put I it understand just, that what's in the Bible is supposed to be the Word of God. Well, no, I want okay, to put and it in the... if I tell you a story, uh, say we're in a room and I tell you a story about a penguin and a duck, by the time it gets to the last person in the room, it turns it to, to a story yeah, about an yeah, elephant but, and a pig. Well, I'll quickly answer it's this. It's everybody's... The, yeah, the, uh, the, fi right, the telephone game. Well, see, that's the great, one of the greatest proofs of the Bible is the fact you can't even tell a story in a room without it getting distorted, and yet the Bible has the exact same thing here now as it did 2,000 years ago. They found those old manuscripts, as I told you yeah, earlier. They, them they translated them, and they're exactly what we have today. Even the Old Testament and the Dead Sea Scrolls, they've already found that. That's all there. It hasn't been mistranslated, so it is a miracle. I agree with you. It is a miracle. But it did happen, and it is a great proof, and it's why you should believe the Bible, actually. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do believe a lot of the things that are in the Bible. It just seems to me that since it has been written by mortal man to be passed down from one hand to another. Did you just hear? Well, go ahead, go ahead. Well, uh, what we want to say is you're, you're misstating some things, is that we do have the manuscripts, and they're in London, they're in, in Russia, they're in France, they're Israel. in different places in Israel, and the London Bible Society and the French Bible Society, and that you could, if you're a Greek scholar, go down there and look at them, and, and the Vatican has the Vaticanus, and, and translate it yourself. What we're saying is that, let's say we have, at one time, they had 
the, the only manuscript we had, complete manuscript, was maybe in the fourth century. And we said, aha, this is the Bible. And people say, this is the Word of God. And all of a sudden they find one towards the end of, of the, uh, the second century. We go, uh-oh, let's compare it, boy. It's going to... We're really going to show you that this little uh, scenario you said of passing down and all this. So certainly, you know, over hundreds of years, there's the uh, uh, discrepancies. Well, they're 98 to 95 percent the same, and the only difference is in Lord Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus or dwelling or place or whatever you want want to say. And and so they're 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 then we have uh, manuscript fragments going away all the way down into the first century. And they mat what would be the odds of them matching what we have now? And they do. And then with the Old Testament, we, the earliest uh, writings that we had up to the point of the Masoretic Test, because the Jews destroyed most of the other ones, was up beside the Septuagint, was written 300 years before Christ, was about the 9th century. And so, lo and behold, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, boy, all the higher criticism just folded because they, were, they matched perfectly. So your argument about we don't have manuscript evidence and broad manuscript evidence, we do. Oh, yeah. It's just whether you want to believe these eyewitnesses are telling the truth or not. Yeah. It's See, not I mean, that they, they, they weren't capable of telling the truth. You just don't want to believe them because the evidence of the manuscripts dating back to the eyewitnesses is very strong. Let me recommend well, as, this as, book. As you point about the eyewitnesses, sir, uh, you and I can look at the color and the screen. You say it's one shade, and I say it's another shade. And see, the, the, I know about the Dead Sea Scrolls and all. Well, we're not talking about, about that. The, the, the when, of the writings before that. No, when when these men went to their death, all their character of all of all the history, people have looked into it, say these men are of highest character. If you ever go, if they ever ask you to go to a jury, sir, you just say, I cannot ever make a decision because evidence. I'll look at it one way, it'll be purple, and somebody else will say it's gray. We never can come to this evidence. Yeah. You just disregard everything. Like, like the, when you the, come to a stoplight, you better not drive cars or anything because you are incapable of making well, any decisions. It's true. Like, like, did George Washington cross the Delaware? Well, we can't really know, you know, because uh, that one eyewitness might have saw him and another. No, or, we or, know he did because of the, the evidence. Multiple and, and of eyewitnesses. The multiple ability of eyewitnesses also. You know the Bible is true because of the massive detail, uh, how it all fits together. I mean, it's incredible. Why would man, and I know this is passed around in colleges, you know, oh, culture makes it up or whatever. Uh, why would man write a book that condemns him to hell, says he's a sinner, has no hope, that God is so holy and, and just and, and there's really no hope of salvation he that, he's a, and, and that he's a sinner and destined for eternal hell. Men just don't write books like that. They write books about how great they are, how noble they are, how wonderful they are. You know, like the preachers preach today, how, how the big churches grow by telling everybody how great they are, how there's no such thing as hell or sin. That's how you build big, build church, build big churches and make lots of money. You don't make a lot of popularity by saying the message of the Bible. The Bible, uh, one of the reasons I know it's true, besides looking at history and looking at the archaeology and everything it says has come to pass. You can go and you can find the tombs, you can find the libraries, you can find the towns that it talks about. I mean, you can't find that in the Book of Mormon. There's a big old Book of Mormon, you can't find one stick. But you find, you know, thousands and, you know, 25,000 archaeological finds on the Bible. You can go over there, fly over there, and find them all. They do tours. Well, you know? Can I recommend this book? It's called uh, The First New Testament by David Estrada and William White, Jr. And it has uh, manuscript, you know, you can, it, it's throughout it. It's got pictures of parchments and uh, things from the Dead Sea Scrolls, particularly the Cave 7, uh, verifying, you know, what would, what, David and uh, Dale have been saying here, the historical and archaeological evidence for the Bible is overwhelming. So to come up with little stories like, well, I'm in a room and I can tell a story about a, a, a pig and a duck, it, it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't wash in this context. And also I wanted to just go back to your initial question just real quick so we can wrap this up and go on to the other callers. But let's go to, uh, you were talking about us being judgmental and maybe pompous and all this stuff. But then here, here's the resurrected Christ talking in Revelation chapter 2, in verse 2. He's talking to the church at Ephesus, and he says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And he goes on to commend them because he 
because this church is exposing these false prophets and he knows and they're saying that these guys say they're apostles but they're not they're a bunch of liars you go on to the next chapter verse 3 verse 9 or chapter 3 verse 9 jesus says behold i will make them of the synagogue of satan which say they are jews and are not but do lie behold i will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that i have loved thee so you have Jesus commending these churches for exposing false prophets and standing against false well, doctrine and lies. It's very, it's very simple. Um, you know, we we are nothing. Okay, first of all, you know, we're we're personally, you know, we're we're nothing. We're we're not pompous or prideful. But I know nowadays. I know what your point is. You know, nowadays, if someone says I know an answer or I have the truth, everybody kind of jumps on them. And say, how dare you think you're the only one with the truth? But what if you do have the truth? What if you do have the cure for cancer and you don't tell anyone? What if you do have the truth and you know the evidence? Shouldn't you tell people? Shouldn't you share that with people and say, and see, that's what we're doing. We want to show, we're telling people, hey, go look into this evidence. Read the Bible for yourself. There's lots of books out there that will give you the archaeological evidence. Uh, first of all, if it was distorted, it wouldn't make any sense at all. If this thing had been distorted like a room does when you pass them, it would be a bunch of garbled words. It wouldn't be able to be, go over to Israel and fi dig it up and find the town and verify everything it says. You know, It wouldn't have the same name on the inscriptions. You'd have, you know, you would have a big distortion. It wouldn't make sense at all. It'd be a fairy tale. But it's not. It's a historically, even the most liberal scholars will say it's historically accurate. And, and you can throw out, they just throw out the God part. But, but they have to agree that it's a historical book. And the Bible says that we suppress the truth. That we do not want Jesus Christ. We do not want God authority over us. You're we, about the natural we, man. We, the natural man, by nature, we all want to do our own thing. We want to sin. We want to be addicted to it. We want to get rebellious as we can against God. We hate the truth and we'll do anything to get away from it. And that's what we see happening around us. That's a big proof of the Bible. You know, everybody wants to use Jesus Christ in their little cult or religion, but they all want to change who the Bible says He is. Why is that? A little suspicious that they all use Jesus Christ, especially when Jesus said they would in the last days uh, say, I'm the Christ. And here's, a, here's 2,000 years ago, a little, little Jewish guy in Israel saying everybody's going to say they're the Christ, and Satan hates Christ, and, and, and he's the, Satan attacks Christ and attacks the Bible. I mean, you add up all these lines of evidence, you know, and it all fits exactly with what the book is saying. You have to believe the book. Well, look at the They're logic. not liars. Uh, what Dale says is absolutely true, and just the reality of the situation we find ourselves in. A lot of people say, well, if God's really there, why didn't he just put a big sign in the sky saying, I'm here, you know. Uh, well, the next no, day, it, people would say on CNN, oh, it was just an illusion, or, yeah, or, or it, but, was, it was the, the sun. But, but the key is, the Bible tells you men aren't going to believe. The Bible tells you that men are going to do their own thing. They're going to create their own false religions. They're going to do all these wild and things. And it also says God lets men go in their own deception and believe in their own lies. Uh, so everything we see around us actually fits to what we see the Bible telling us about. It, it, it's not like God is sitting there, well, if there's really a God, why don't he just have everybody believe and it'll be all great and there's, no, there's more car wrecks, there's no more death in the family, there's no more cancer. If there's really a God there and he loves us all, why don't we have all these wonderful things happening in our life? Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there's going to be false prophets, there's a devil running around, there's going to be tragedies, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes. It's going to be a bad situation. And God's allowing it. The God of this Bible is allowing all this to take place, even the false prophets to run around and deceive people. But it all fits reality. Don't you see? It fits reality. It doesn't deny reality. Yeah, That's see, all Dale's see, saying. Yeah. He says this thing and, and fits I, I just use again as the example <laughs> the Book of Mormon. You can read yeah. it. It all seems to make sense, like a nice little story, right? But you can't find any of the money used. You can't find any of the cities. You can't find anything in the entire book to be verified. It's, it's a whole book, and, and you can't find any kind of evidence at all. But if it was true, you should, and you can, now, uh, you can with the Bible. If I may, one last question. Um, and this is, uh, this is a question I ask different people from uh, different uh, racial backgrounds, different religions. And I want to just get your opinions. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say you're right or wrong because it's up to everybody's own opinion. What did Jesus look like and what does God look like? 
But a lot of people try to jump on that and say he's this or that. The Bible says, first of all, no one can look upon God and live, and no one has seen God the Father. God is spirit, okay? Jesus Christ, God incarnate. Uh, uh, Ron Rhodes wrote a book, Christ Before the Manger. He goes through all the accounts of pre-incarnate Christ where Christ appeared to people all through the Old Testament before he was actually born and, and lived as a, as a man. And it's called Pre-Incarnation uh, pre of Christ. Uh, it's called Theophany, it's Christophanies, uh, Angel of the Lord, that, those kind of things. But um, Jesus was born uh, Jewish. I mean, he was Jewish. And he wasn't black and he wasn't white. He was, he was of, the, of, you know, the Jewish line. So he would have, uh, you know, however that would have looked, you know, Let me give the Bible skin. description of how it looked. Weren't, weren't, the, uh, weren't some of the Jews back then, weren't they from uh, the areas of, like, Ethiopia? The, there's no. some that were proselytes and all that, but, but uh, what yeah. we're saying is the Bible doesn't tell us what Jesus looked like. Well, here's yeah. the Except closest. in Revelation. Let me, well, like, look, we got Isaiah 53. Oh, you got well, an incredible prophecy yeah. about this is just one of 400, over 400 prophecies of, the, of hmm. Jesus in the Old Testament written hundreds of years before Christ even walked the earth. That's another thing that makes the Bible so valid. You got all these incredible prophecies that are fulfilled in Christ when he gets to the New Testament out of the Old Testament. But anyway, here's what it says. This is about as close as you're going to get in uh, Isaiah 53, this Messianic prophecy. And it says in verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So basically, when we, with, if we were looking at him, we'd say, huh, just kind of a, you know, there's nothing much there that I can. Regular I guy. Yeah, yeah, just a regular guy. And it goes on to talk about he was despised and rejected a man, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with yeah. grief. And we had to wear our faces. As you go through this whole chapter, it talks all about how this Jesus, this Messiah, is going to be killed for our transgressions and be punished by the Lord. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief and it, you go on. But it's another incredible prophecy in the Bible. But that's about as close as you're going to get. Yeah. You can take a look at him and you're not going to think much of But you know, the, the, thing about, uh, the thing about Christianity, it's, it's for all men, all types of men. And we talked about it earlier, it's a every man's religion. The entire world, anybody can come to Christ. And whether you be, you know, white or black or anything, and some of these groups, the white, you know, KKK or the Farrakhan, the Nation of Islam movement, uh, they're, you know, bigots and basically try to say, well, this is our religion. It's only for whites or it's, you know, or like the Mormons used to say, blacks were, you know, cursed and couldn't be saved and all that. But you see, that's just man getting in there and distorting the thing. Uh, Jesus was Jewish and, and uh, you know, how he looked really doesn't matter. It's who, who he was. And some of these groups will say, well, he was this and that. Uh, I would say that, you know, you know, just forget all that and find out who Jesus Christ, who he really is. Was he God in the flesh? And, and, and you know, ask God to show you uh, the truth, read the scriptures, and ask God to give you the ability to repent of your sin, to be convicted of your sin, so that you can repent of your sin and give your life to him. And that goes back to his original question then. Why can we can interpret the Bible this way and others? It's because when you're born again, through the power of the Holy Spirit after doing what Dale just said, and you turn to Christ and you actually believe on Him and you're filled with the Holy Spirit as the Scripture talks about, then you can read this Bible and understand what it yeah. says for the first time. But the just, well, just, when you don't uh, have the Spirit, you can't really understand it. You're reading somebody else's mail. Read, read it for yourself. Just read it. Read it and pray. And that's the best thing I can tell you. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine 
proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled, Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are, Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, Vessel to You, Waiting to Hear From You, Jesus Is, and Others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, right now, free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, -S -S -E in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at aol.com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you, and may the Lord bless you and yours. To the